Most people who are familiar with professional baseball have heard of the curse of the billy goat. This curse was allegedly placed on our beloved Chicago Cubs franchise back in 1945 by the owner of the billy goat tavern. His pet goat, who for whatever reason accompanied him to a game, was bothering other fans and he was asked to leave Wrigley Field. Game four of the 1945 World Series. And on his way out, he allegedly said this, and I quote, them Cubs, they ain't gonna win no more. Now we could spend the rest of the day arguing about the effectiveness of a curse that was so poorly worded, but it wasn't until 2016 that the Cubs actually won the World Series. And for many in Chicago, the curse was the best reason for that 100 plus year drought and for the many heartbreaking near misses during that period of time. But in the long run, the potential curse of a sports team, even one that lasts over 100 years, pales in comparison to a spiritual curse that lasts for all eternity, right? And yet that is our spiritual condition. In our natural state apart from Christ, we are born under a curse. We are rejected by a holy God and separated from him. This is not a curse that lasts 10 years or 100 years, but forever. It is a curse with no hope, no hope of escaping apart from a miracle of God. So how did that happen? And what does it look like to live under this curse? And what is this miracle, this way of escape that God provides? These are some of the most important questions we can ever ask. And they're questions that we're going to ask this morning from Galatians 3 and from other passages as well. This message is the first in our Advent series which we've entitled Holding Out Hope. In times that are as difficult, as troubling as the ones that we live in, we are holding out hope that things will get better. We are looking to better days in the future. Without hope, people lose their joy. They lose their strength. And eventually, they could even lose their will to live. You know, a vivid picture of hopelessness is found in Dante's uh, epic 14th century poem, Divine Comedy, which contains the following words etched on the gates of hell, warning everyone who enter. Abandon all hope, you who enter here. Abandon all hope. But of course, no one has to enter hell, even though we are born under an eternal curse, because God is holding out hope to all of us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Yes, we are born under a curse that separates us from God, but Jesus is the curse breaker. As Pastor Philip mentioned from John 5 last week, Jesus said something that stunned the religious leaders who wanted to kill him for blasphemy. He said, beginning in verse 45, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all bestsellers. Combined, they're known as the Pentateuch or the Torah. And in this Advent series, we're going to take a look at five ways that Moses prophesied about Jesus and his ministry that gives us hope, an eternal hope. And this morning, we begin with Moses speaking about one who would come and redeem us from the curse that mankind has been under since Adam and Eve's rebellion. Our outline is simple. The origin of the curse, the effect of the curse, and the end of the curse. We begin with the origin of the curse. And for that, we turn to Genesis chapter 3. You know, when God created the world, it was perfect. There was no sin. There was no sorrow. There was no death. There was no curse, only blessing. God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, a place of peace, a place of joy, of beauty, and abundance. But it was also a place where their faith in God would be tested. Genesis 2, verses 16 through 17 say this, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And tragically, they failed that test. Satan, in the form of a serpent, 
convinced them that God was lying to them. That he was withholding something from them that was both desirable and good. And they believed him. One commentator said this, Adam should have crushed the head of the serpent under his foot then and there. He should have squashed this rebellion rather than taking part in it. Had he done so, Adam and Eve would have been able to eat their fill of the tree of life without ever having to experience death. Instead, they believed the serpent over the Lord and they rebelled against him by breaking the one command he had given them, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now you likely know the story. After they sinned, God came to Adam and Eve in the garden and he asked Adam in Genesis 3.11, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? It's a simple yes or no question, but Adam believes that he'll be better off by giving his answer some context. So he says, the woman who you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Now that's a lot of words to say yes. What he's doing here is before he admits his own guilt, he's saying what God had done and then what Eve had done. It's almost as if Adam is saying, you know, it looks like we're all a little guilty here, right, Lord? And unfortunately, that's how we respond to sin so often today. And then in verse 13, the Lord turned to Eve and said, what is this that you have done? Now Eve responds by saying, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Eve uses fewer words but follows the same pattern of her husband in trying to blame someone else first. The effects of sin are seen immediately in the garden. God then turned to the serpent in verse 14, not with a question, but with a judgment. Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In this verse, traditionally called the first preaching of the good news, Moses prophesies about a future seed of the woman who will, as one commentator put it, deal the death blow to the serpent. Moses is writing of a future redeemer who will bring hope by breaking the curse of sin. And after cursing the serpent, the Lord turned to the woman and said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And turning to Adam, the Lord said, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It's probably a familiar line, but let that sink in for a minute. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Adam and Eve thought they were gaining godlike knowledge, but what they gained instead was death. Dust. I mean, it is a stark and painful contrast to what the Bible says about humanity elsewhere. Consider Hebrews 2, 7 through 9. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. And of course, at creation, Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And now dust. That all changed with their rebellion and the curse that followed. You realize there has never been a greater human tragedy in all of human history. With the exception of what it cost God to fix the problem that our sin created. The extravagant, overwhelming blessing of God now exchanged for life under the curse. So what do we do with that truth? How do we respond to that? If you don't know the Lord, you need to run to him for mercy and for rescue. Because whether you realize it or not, you are living under this curse. You are separated from God because of your sin. And Jesus is your only hope. And so you need to run to him. 
But if you are a follower of Jesus, this reality should make you hate the sin in your life even more. We must never take lightly our sin. When you consider the misery that one act of rebellion threw the world into. So that's how the curse began. And now let's take a look at its effects. Our country was founded in part because of our opposition to taxation without representation. We all learned about that in school. And I've met more than one British citizen over the years who's asked me, so how's that working out for you? And, you know, there's some truth to that. Not all representation is good. I mean, it's good to have someone represent you, probably in a court of law, someone holding out your interest, but it's not always good. Simply put, the Bible teaches that Adam represented not only himself, but all of humanity who has ever lived and all humanity who will ever live. So that his sin, his failure and rebellion has repercussions for every human being who will ever live. Romans 5.12 puts it this way. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. What does that look like in our lives? Because we're not dead yet, right? Death is coming, but right now we're alive. It's a spiritual death he's talking about. The Bible puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The Apostle Paul his, here is describing the effect of being under a spiritual curse. We are by very nature children of wrath. That is, we are the objects of the righteous anger of a holy God because of our sin. That is how much God hates sin. And that should frighten sinners a great deal. To put it simply, the effect of the curse is that, we, that we are under is that we have been rejected by God. We are alienated from him because we have rebelled against him. That is our natural state. And only until we end our rebellion and receive God's provision for our sin can we escape the curse that we are under. The curse is seen everywhere. It's seen in our lives and in the world around us. In fact, Romans 8.21 talks about the sin affecting all of creation. It says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You realize that this curse that we are under, it explains why the world is in such a great mess. It answers the question, how can an all-powerful and all-loving God create a world that looks like the one that we live in? This curse also explains why so many people feel isolated and broken during the holidays. We experience this curse in our lives as we're seeking to fill this desire that can only be met by God with all kinds of destructive things. But you know, there is another aspect to this curse. After Adam and Eve sinned, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But God's plan to permanently restore his relationship with humanity continued. And in time, God called Abraham, the father of the Jews, his chosen people. And through Moses, he gave them the law. You see, in order for God, who is holy and perfect, completely separate from sin, to dwell with his people who are sinful, he gave them good commandments that touched on virtually every area of their lives. Their jobs, their clothing, their food, their relationships, and of course, their worship. In the paradise of the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve just one command. But the law given to his people through Moses contained over 600 commands. Now Romans 7.12 tells us, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. But to go from one command to 600 is unbearable. I mean, think of the weight of those laws. We're kind of getting 
a small taste of that now with the various laws or guidelines about so many things related to COVID-19. We have social distancing. We have masks. And the one that really bothers me the most, I have to wash my hands. And who came up with that? I mean, I thought we were following the science. I can't wait till that's over. But do you realize that God intended these laws to be a weight on his people? He intended them to feel the weight of that. It was a constant reminder of one's sinfulness because of all of the sacrifices that were regularly required. But you know, the biggest problem of the law isn't the number of commands. It's the fact that we simply cannot fulfill it. We cannot fulfill it. Which means it cannot rescue anyone from the curse. The Apostle Paul, here he's referencing Deuteronomy chapter 27. He says this in Galatians 3.10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So here's the problem. God's chosen people, Israel, were given these laws in response to the curse. Now, if they could live faithfully under them, they would have a right relationship with God. But the problem for them, and for all Gentiles as well, according to Romans 2.15, is that no one, no one can abide by all the things written in the book of the law. I mean, think about it. If we cannot obey one commandment of God while in paradise, how can we possibly obey over 600 commands that affect virtually every area of our lives? We can't. And we don't. Why? You might ask, why can't we obey the law fully? Well, I think there's at least three reasons. The first one is we don't want to. I mean, let's be honest. The law commands you to do things you don't want to do. And it commands you not to do things that you want to do. So sometimes we just like our sin or we love our sin. And it's as simple as that. Number two, the standard is perfection. I mean, even if we hadn't already blown it at this point in our lives, and we have, moving forward, we could never sin. Not once. There are no cheat days. There's no days off. There are no areas of our lives where the law is exempt. In all of these areas, we are supposed to perfectly obey the Lord. And then third, even though the law is good, this is such a critical point, the law inspires even more sin in sinful people. Look at what Paul says in Romans 7, 5. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. The law actually arouses sin in sinful people. That's how sinful we are. Now consider the sign that will come up on the screen here. Please do not throw stones at this sign. I'm not exactly sure why, why the sign was even put up. But you probably don't walk into a park thinking, I can't wait to find a sign and throw a rock at it. But when you see a sign like that, and you see all the dents, isn't the first thought that comes to your mind is, where, where can I find a rock? Because I want to throw a rock at that stone. That's what the law does in the hearts of sinful people. The curse has alienated us from God because of our disobedience. And it affects every area of our lives and all of creation. And we are helpless. We are helpless to escape its impact on our own. That is the simple and plain truth. It is truly the most desperate situation that we can find ourselves in. And it is shocking that people all over the world have deceived themselves into believing that this is not true of them. That they are somehow exempt so what do we do with this truth? I speak particularly to those of you who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why God has called his people to tell people who are far from him the good news of the gospel. I mean, imagine going to the doctor and after examining you, he finds cancer. But rather than tell you, he just prays that somehow the Lord would let you know that you have cancer so that you could get the treatment that you need. It would be ridiculous. Followers of Jesus, the world is under an eternal curse. They are separated from God because of their sin. There is only one hope. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. 
They need to hear the bad news. And then they need to hear the good news, the great news, that Jesus Christ is the curse breaker. We must tell people. God help us if we don't. Finally, the end of the curse. And for this, we turn to Galatians chapter 3. And what you should know about this chapter is that all of the storyline of Scripture points here. And the whole of this chapter points to a single verse. Verse 13. There is so much depth and truth in this passage that I want to strongly encourage you to read it on your own today, soon, multiple times. And ask the Lord to help you not only understand it, but to apply it as well. It has something for everyone, no matter where you are spiritually. So how does the curse end? Well, verse 13 says this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. So think about that for a minute. That was God's solution to our curse problem. The Bible teaches that God is all-knowing, that God is all-powerful. He is supremely wise and he can do anything that is in keeping with his holy character. That means that the best and the only solution, the only way for us to be rescued from the curse was for the perfect holy son of God to become a curse for us. Because God is holy, he cannot wipe sin under some large cosmic rug and pretend that it doesn't exist. We try to do that, but we're not holy as God is. A holy God must respond to sin with holiness. And that means that God does not minimize or tolerate or ignore sin. He deals with all of it from the smallest to the biggest in a holy and righteous way. And he responds to it with righteous anger because sin is an affront to his holiness and it harms his creation. You realize that the, in, the, the impulse that you and I have against injustice that we see is a mere taste of God's holy response to sin. But that impulse that we have, it helps us to see why such a costly cure was necessary for such a crushing curse. Now what's critical for us to understand from Galatians 3 is the argument that Paul makes surrounding how we apply this cure to our lives. That Jesus became a curse for us. And he goes to lengths to help us understand that, that not getting this right isn't simply misunderstanding the gospel. It is actually rejecting the gospel. Let's read Galatians 3, 1 through 14. Paul begins, O foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law? Or by hearing with faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying. In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. There's a lot there. It is a wonderful and freeing truth. Now you will remember that in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve believed the serpent rather than God. And their failure to do that plunged the world into a nightmare. And what Paul is saying here is that the way out, the breaking of this curse, 
does not and cannot come from anything that you and I can do. Any good deeds, any obedience to the law. Only, only through what Jesus did on the cross. The Apostle Paul basically calls the Galatians ignoramuses for thinking that. And so the test for us, just like it was for Adam and Eve, is simple. Will you believe? Will you believe, as God's word teaches, that you cannot possibly fulfill the law of God perfectly? You are not good enough on your own. And will you believe, as God's word teaches, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that includes you? And will you believe, as God's word teaches, that on the cross Jesus took the curse, our curse, your curse, if you believe, on himself so that we might be redeemed. There is simply no other escape from the curse that we are under. You know, when I was growing up, everyone knew who the heavyweight champion of the world was. It was Muhammad Ali. He was charismatic, strong, and he never seemed to lack for self-confidence. He has been ranked the greatest heavyweight champion of all time and the greatest athlete of the 20th century by Sports Illustrated magazine. In his early 20s, Ali converted to Islam, renouncing his Christian upbringing. And shortly after the 9-11 attacks in 2001, he was asked about his faith, and he gave a response that is sadly believed by many people. He said, one day we're all going to die, and God is going to judge us. Our good deeds and bad deeds. If the bad outweighs the good, you go to hell. But if the good outweighs the bad, you go to heaven. If you truly believe that, that is a horrible and a fearful way to live and ultimately a very foolish one. How could you know where you stood at any moment? Is there truly no hope for the man or woman in their 50s or 60s who has truly repented after living a godless life? Is there no hope for them? How would you even walk outside your house aware of the fact that if you got hit by a bus, you were going to spend eternity in hell. That uncertainty would mean living in perpetual fear. And so I would ask you, if that's your approach, is that really what God wants from us? That's his plan? Ali died in 2016, and at his funeral, his wife Lonnie said this about Ali's final years. He awoke every morning thinking about his own salvation, and he would often say, I just want to get to heaven, and I've got to do a lot of good deeds to get there. What a tragedy. Good deeds are wonderful, but God's word couldn't be clearer. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. I like how one pastor put it. Good works aren't the root of salvation. They are the fruit. So let me ask you this. Do you believe that you can work hard enough to somehow earn God's favor if your good deeds outweigh your bad or some calculation like that? Because if that's your plan, explain the cross. Explain why the Son of God had to die. Why did Jesus have to die if you simply have to be good or good enough? It makes no sense. Our rebellion against God means that we are living under a curse until we believe that Jesus took that curse upon himself for our sakes. There's nothing we can do. We can only believe and receive what Jesus did. Notice what Paul says in verse 8 of Galatians 3. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. The passage Paul was referring to is first found in Genesis 12, 3. Paul calls it the preaching of the gospel. Moses wrote these words about Jesus under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it demonstrates that faith, believing in God, in his provision for our salvation, was always the way to be saved. And that's why Habakkuk 2, 4 is quoted here as well. The righteous shall live by his faith. The weight of the law. The weight of our sin and condemnation brings us to our knees and causes us who believe, who have faith in God, to cry out to him. And so if you have not yet believed in Jesus and received the free gift of eternal life, today is the day of salvation. 
trust in him alone and reject this idea that you can make it on your own. Your good deeds will never outweigh your bad deeds. But even if they did, it wouldn't matter because your bad deeds have to be punished. They have to be addressed. Today, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you are saved by believing in him, by trusting in him completely for your salvation, for the forgiveness of your sins. It wasn't what you did, it was what Jesus did. You began your relationship with him by faith. Continue by faith. Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to help us to walk with him. It's not what we do. It's yielding to the Spirit, to his power, to his voice. That's how we walk closely with him. Legalism is a gross sin in the lives of Christians. It gives the impression that we can do something that, that pleases God more than what Jesus did. That it can put us in a, in a place where Jesus' death on the cross couldn't. That's not a misunderstanding of the gospel. That is a rejection of the gospel. That's what Paul is teaching. Instead, we have the sacrifice of Christ, the blessing of the Holy Spirit to help us follow him. The Christmas season is upon us. So let me close by reading, before we sing it together, a few lines from that great Christmas carol, Joy to the World. It begins, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. And it ends this way. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found. Jesus is the curse breaker. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, each one of us needs to apply the truth of your word this morning in different ways. But we yield ourselves to you. And we ask that you would help us to hear your voice and to follow it. Father, save those who are far from you through Jesus, the curse breaker, and help those of us who know you to walk by the power of the Spirit. Having begun by believing in you, let us continue to believe in you and in your provision. Be glorified in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.